Bobby, for that kind, the, your kind invitation and for uh, uh, yeah, for being there. And it's nice to be with you again at the BGF. It has been a bit difficult because of the pandemic recently. And I was really hoping this year to be able to come in person because in many ways, it's nicer to be there in person and to be able to see you all because you have, I think the contact you have when you are face to face is often more powerful and more effective and more inspiring than being so far away. But there are some advantages with Zoom as well. One of the great things with Zoom is that you can have lots of people coming. You're not limited to space, which is a wonderful thing here. But anyway, it's very nice to be able to be with you again and to be able to do some more Dhamma teachings because it is inspiring for everyone. And uh, one of the main reasons I like to do these things is because I also feel inspired by these teachings. So in a sense, it is a privilege to be able to teach and to be able to take part in these things because I think everyone uh, benefits and not least the speaker also benefits a lot. So hopefully it will be a marvelous and a, and a fruitful uh, Sutta retreat. We'll see how things go as we go along here. And um, the idea with these uh, Sutta retreats is always to go back to the word of the Buddha, go back to what the Buddha himself taught and looking at this from a variety of different angles. Uh, one of the things that always strikes me when I look at the Buddhist world is how much contradiction there is in teachings and how often there is disagreements about what the Dhamma is really about. Uh, and you have all the various schools of Buddhism, all the various uh, uh, meditation schools that come out of places like Myanmar, you have the Mahayana Buddhism, of course, and all of these things. Uh, and in the end, if you want to have a clarity about what Buddhism really is about. The only way to get that clarity is to go back to the word of the Buddha. It's the only thing that we all have in common here. So for this reason, I always uh, like to do that because I think this is the standard by which all the rest of Buddhism should be measured. It should be measured against the early suttas. So if you understand the suttas, then you have a foundation for also uh, knowing how to do the practice uh, instead of just listening to contemporary teachers. So uh, that is why I like to do this. And it is kind of surprising because even in an area, this particular meditation, this particular retreat is going to be focused on how the Buddha teaches meditation. And you might be surprised to hear that many of the ways that meditation is taught in the contemporary world, uh, yeah, various places, uh, uh, is often not quite aligned with the sutta. Sometimes it is a little bit, going a little bit in a different direction. Yeah, and because of that, when we come back to the suttas, we can kind of iron out some of the problems uh, with uh, the way meditation is understood. Uh, and by doing that, we can uh, improve our own practice, of course, uh, because the whole point of this at the end of the day is how it leads to a practical application. It's about, you know, how we're going to uh, live our life uh, as Buddhists, how we're going to improve uh, in our meditation practice. Uh, that is ultimately the purpose of this. Uh, it is not just to have some kind of theoretical understanding, but it's actually real. This is real life. This is about how we uh, do the Buddhist practice. Uh, so it matters, you know, it matters that we get it right. It is so common in the Buddhist world, uh, wherever you go, that uh, people do meditation practice sometimes for years, uh, and sometimes they don't make any progress. Uh, and the reason why that is the case, there's two reasons. One is that they don't fully understand how you are supposed to practice. Yeah, they don't really uh, grasp some of the fundamental ideas of Buddhist meditation. Uh, this is one reason. Uh, and another reason is that they, when they do understand them, they don't apply themselves quite in the right way. Uh, these are the two issues. Uh, so by clarifying how we're supposed to do this uh, and then applying this in the right way, uh, there's almost guaranteed that you're going to make pr progress in your meditation. And even if you don't make progress in your meditation, you will make progress in your life, yeah, your life is going to become better. You're going to become a more contented and more happy person. So either way, it's going to be a win-win situation. 
So this is just a little bit of the background to these kind of retreats. And uh, every day we're going to start out with some meditation practice, uh, just to make sure that we are ready uh, for the Dhamma teachings to kind of calm down uh, and also to ensure that we do the practical side. Uh, yeah, we don't just get too caught up with the, the theory, we actually do some practical uh, application as well. Uh, and then there is, like Bobby said, there's going to be a five minute break uh, between every 45 minutes, there's going to be a five minute break. And you can use that as you like. But if you don't have anything in particular that you need to do, just sit back and do some meditation for five minutes uh, every 45 minutes. Uh, because if you do a little bit of meditation for, you know, every now and again, you allow the teachings to sink in. Uh, you gain a bit of clarity of mind again, and this kind of helps you to uh, sustain. It's quite a long, long day, yeah? starting at 8 a.m. and then going till almost 6 p.m. It's a long day, so we need a bit of breaks in between to be able to sustain all of this. Uh, so this is kind of the idea behind this here. So um, just to start out, I thought I would just say a very few words about meditation practice. I'm not going to go long, maybe five or ten minutes, just very, very brief before we actually do some meditation. So um, just to come back to some of the very basic ideas, uh, this is largely going to be a sutta retreat, so meditation will not be the main focus, uh, but still it is good to kind of at least get something out of the meditation. Uh, and there's two main principles of meditation that I want to focus on. Uh, and these are principles that we're going to see later on as we go through the suttas. Uh, I'm going to point it out to you as we go through the Anapanasati Sutta, as we go through the Satipatthana Sutta, uh, what these principles, how they are found in the suttas. Uh, the idea is to bring everything back to the suttas. Uh, and these two things uh, that are like the main guidelines or the main ways of knowing that your meditation is going well, heading in the right direction, two main aspects of meditation practice, how we should experience meditation. Yeah, On the one hand is the degree of peace that you have in your meditation, and the other hand is a degree of happiness or well-being or contentment or satisfaction that you have. And both of these should increase and should improve as you do your meditation practice. Yeah, you should be experiencing more and more well-being. You should be experiencing deeper, deeper states of peace. That's the whole purpose of meditation. So you measure your meditation by these things. And even if you are just reducing your suffering a little bit, yeah, you're feeling a bit more at ease and a bit more relaxed, that is already kind of the idea of heading, you're already heading in the right direction, because that is just another way of thinking about happiness. Reduction in suffering means more happiness, yeah? More happiness means a reduction in suffering. So these things go together. Yeah. So to be able to do this, to be able to find that peace and ease of meditation, yeah? First of all, to start with the peaceful side of meditation. Peace happens when the world around us fades away, yeah? Yeah, you have in the uh, Eightfold Path, you have the second factor of the Noble Eightfold Path is the Samma Sankappa, right intention. And the uh, first one of right, there's three kinds of right intention. The first one is the Nekama Sankappa, the intention to renounce. And the intention to renounce in meditation just means that you let go of the world a little bit. Yeah, it's like you allow the world to fade away here. And when you allow the world to fade away, that is where you become peaceful. Huh? Because allowing the world to fade away is the opposite of craving. Yeah? It's allowing things to become peaceful in your life. Huh? And the way to allow the uh, world to fade away is just by relaxing, yeah? by enjoying what you're doing, yeah? by sitting back, yeah? not by doing your meditation, but allowing the meditation to happen. Yeah? And as you do that, uh, you actually start to find that the world does really fade away. Uh, but by trying to do the meditation, you are just trying to, you're just doing more of the same that we always do, which is trying to create things in the world. Uh, 
when you allow the world to fade away, not doing anything in meditation, huh? that is where peace starts to happen. Huh? And uh, it can be very useful to have some ideas of how to do this, because the idea of just being still and not doing anything is very counter to what we are like as human beings. Human beings, we like to do things. We like to create. We like to get involved in the world. And the ability to sit back and just allow things to be and just to enjoy is actually quite difficult. So one way of thinking of that is to think of yourself. This is kind of just a simile that I use for how to be able to relax. Yeah, And a way of thinking about this is to think about what you do when you come home from work, you had a long day's work and you're really tired or you've been doing something. How do you, what do you do when you are really tired? When you have worked really hard, your mind is exhausted. And what you do is you may sit back in a nice chair, yeah, really relaxing in a nice chair. And then as you sit in a nice chair, you just close your eyes, you lean back and you just take a deep breath. And what, what do you do? You don't do anything, right? Because when you are really tired, you don't want to do anything. You just want to relax. So that idea of just sitting back and relaxing when you're tired, that is a little bit like meditation practice. Because the idea is to do almost nothing and then allow the mind to just be guided by the Dhamma and then moving on to the breath or moving on to your meditation object as a consequence. So try to move back a little bit, uh, to let go a little bit more of the world, uh, to allow the world to be here. Uh, remember that the world outside is always out of control. Uh, the world outside isn't all that interesting. Uh, what is interesting is the spiritual practice, the spiritual path, uh, because that is where we actually create something really useful. Uh. So that is the idea of peace, the idea of letting go of things, uh, which is kind of fundamental to meditation practice. Uh. But the other side of meditation is the side of happiness that I just mentioned before. Yeah? And this is the idea uh, when we start out our meditation is to put our mind onto something which is you feel good about, yeah? something which is uplifting, yeah? something which is inspiring, yeah? something that may give you a little bit of joy. Yeah? At the very least, you have to let go of any kind of uh, negative feelings that you have uh, as you start out your meditation practice. Uh, so this is then the second aspect. Uh, so a very important part of the meditation uh, is this ability to bring that positive energy inside. Uh, yeah? And this can be done in so many different ways. Uh, it can be done by reflecting how fortunate you are to be part of a wonderful Buddhist community so many supportive people. Yeah, you have the BGF in Malaysia, wherever you are in the world. I'm not sure if uh, all of you are BGF members, probably not. Uh, when you are part of this wonderful supportive Buddhist network, network, something that uplifts you, something that makes you feel, uh, can, helps you forward in life, yeah? allows you to see things in a new way, understand uh, life uh, through new glasses, understanding what is actually going on, how to live better. Uh, what a wonderful thing it is to have such Kalyanamittas in the world. Uh, and then, of course, you have the Sangha, you have the word of the Buddha. All of these things coming together is very powerful and very beautiful. Uh, so this, in this way, you can inspire yourself or you can think about how you have lived your life. You have lived your life well. And because of that, uh, you have this wonderful opportunity to uh, you know, practice well, and you think back on your life, you know you have lived well, and you feel inspired by these things. Uh, you feel inspired by the suttas, uh, you feel inspired by the Buddha, you feel inspired by some act of kindness that you have done in the past. Uh, so these are little ways, yeah, of kind of giving a boost in your meditation practice. Uh, so when you start your meditation, these are the two things that you should start out with. Uh, allow yourself to relax, uh, Allow yourself to let go of the world a little bit, uh, to leave the world behind. Uh, and then also uh, gently nudge your mind in the direction of a little bit of joy, a little bit of happiness. Uh, and then, then when that is kind of established uh, at the very beginning, then you can allow the process to happen by itself. Uh, allow the meditation to deepen. 
gradually, gradually becoming more and more powerful. Uh, so this is the uh, theory uh, of meditation practice. Uh, <laughs> so let's see what happens. Theory is only theory. So let's try and see what happens in real life. Uh, so let's do a little bit of meditation together. And then we'll come back to the suttas in about 40 minutes or so. Okay, everyone, so just uh, as always, just start out by making sure you are comfortable, uh, that your body is in the right way. Uh, remember, this is the middle path, it's not a path of uh, self-torture or self-torment, uh, but it's a way of learning to relax. Uh, and to be able to be relaxed, you have to be at ease, uh, not super duper comfortable, but at ease and relaxed. Uh, and enjoying what you're doing here. And uh, as you do this, uh, please remember the simile of the armchair, uh, just sitting back, uh, allowing things to be, uh, not trying to control anything at all, uh, as if you're just relaxing, uh, relaxing, calming down, enjoying and being at ease.
and uh, just gradually allow the world to fade into the background. Uh, and as you do this, remember that uh, there is no right way of doing meditation. Uh, meditation isn't this way or that way. Uh, meditation is just about calming down and being at ease. Uh, so don't judge what is happening here. Uh, don't tell yourself that you shouldn't be thinking or you shouldn't be doing anything at all. Uh, just allow things to be here. Uh, and usually by allowing things to be, uh, the mind straightens itself out all by itself. Uh, so just keep on enjoying here, uh, allowing the world to fade away. Uh.
And uh, as you allow the meditation to progress by itself, uh, make sure that you are patient. Patience is the fastest way of meditation practice, uh, just allowing things to be, uh, not getting involved in the content of your mind, uh, but gradually allowing things to fade away. Uh, and it's very important here to enjoy the peace uh, and to notice how, more, how much more beautiful the peace is uh, than the world outside, uh, how noisy the world outside is, uh, how it tends to disturb you. Uh, and now finally in meditation, uh, you can find a real peace and letting go. Uh,
And if you do find yourself thinking about life or thinking about the world or about the future or the past, uh, just remind yourself uh, that there is nothing really interesting in that world. Uh, that world is so unreliable, so uncertain. Uh, you never know what's going to happen next. Uh, and because of that, uh, it is much better to focus on the spiritual path right here and now, uh, the meditation itself. Uh, so let go of that world, uh, come back to the peace within uh, and gently start observing the breath instead. Uh,
Okay, so we're coming close to the end. Before we come to the end, uh, just take a minute just to review your meditation. Uh, if you do feel more peaceful, more calm, uh, more at ease, uh, then ask yourself why that is the case. Okay, everyone, that's the end of the meditation for now. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> I, we can start with the suttas uh, and see how we go. And uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the idea here is to understand meditation practice from the point of the view of the Buddha. And there is lots of interesting material in the suttas about specifically about meditation practice. Uh, so I wanted to draw all of that together. And of course, we're going to look at the big suttas of meditation. Yeah, the suttas such as the Anapanasati Sutta, the Satipatthana Sutta. These are the core meditation suttas. Uh, but I also want to look at some suttas that are more, if you like, preliminary, that kind of get us started in meditation, how it all builds up from the beginning. Uh, and then we move on to the core suttas later on. Uh, and uh, this is one of the... I think important things about meditation practice is that it is like a stage-wise process. There are certain things that we have to do to start out, certain things that belong to the beginning, how we prepare our mind, how we get ready for meditation. Because if we don't prepare the mind in the right way, the meditation becomes basically impossible. Yeah, you try to watch the breath, the breath, breath doesn't really want to stay with you, the breath tries to run away, or you try to run away from the breath, or whatever it is. And it's very hard because uh, uh, the mind isn't really ready for the meditation practice. Uh, so a lot of the ideas that I'm going to talk about at the beginning is how to get ready for meditation. And uh, what is interesting about this idea of being ready for meditation is that uh, a large part of that is about right view. Uh, it's about looking at the world in the right way. Huh? And the more we look at the world in the right way, huh? the more uh, the mind will generally go towards the peace, it will go towards the happiness, uh, it will go towards the enjoyment, uh, it will go towards the letting go. Yeah, letting go comes from right view, really. So if you look at the world in the right way, then things happen almost automatically. Yeah? And uh, we can know that that is true. And the reason we can know that that is true is that, you know, the way the Buddha speaks about a stream enterer, for example, the famous Sotapanna in the suttas, uh, the stream enterer is someone who achieves meditation easily. Uh, for the stream enterer, the samadhi, the deep stages of meditation, they're always there, very close by, uh, easy at hand. Uh, why is that the case? Uh, why is it the case that stream entry allows you to meditate deeply almost every time you sit down? And the reason is because you have right view. You're looking at the world in the right way. You know where to find happiness and where suffering is to be found. And this is one of the basic definitions of right view, is the idea that right view tells you where happiness is and where suffering is. That's a very interesting idea when you, when you consider it. Uh, yeah, the idea that right view is really about understanding happiness and suffering. Uh, 
And uh, so when you have right view, you know exactly what you have to do to go towards happiness. And you know exactly what you have to do to avoid suffering. Yeah. If you haven't got right view, you don't really understand that. Yeah. It's a very powerful insight. And of course, in a way, you know that that is true. This is what the Four Noble Truths are about. Yeah, the Four Noble Truths, uh, they start out with the idea of dukkha, of suffering. And of course, if you understand dukkha, if you understand suffering, you also understand happiness. You understand sukkha, the opposite of dukkha. These things always go together here. Yeah? So if you understand where happiness is to be found and where suffering is found, the mind will go towards the happiness. Yeah? So the idea here is if you understand that the world outside is not that interesting here. Yeah? If you understand that the world of the five senses is inherently problematic, yeah, there's so, too many wars, there's too many problems in that world, there's too much climate change, there's too many pandemics, yeah, there's too many natural disasters, there's too many refugee crises happening around the world. That world is always kind of problematic. Yeah? And when you start to understand that in a deep way, it's like you withdraw your attention from that world. Yeah? And you understand that the world within, that is where you can find the real happiness instead. So by understanding happiness and suffering, this very fundamental idea, this fundamental aspect of right view, actually the mind is guided by itself. The mind automatically goes towards the happiness and avoids the suffering. So right view is foundational for meditation practice. The more powerful your right view is, the easier meditation is going to be for you. So right view is always a very good place to start. So many, some of the suttas we're gonna have a look at now are in large part about this idea of right view, how to think about the world in the right way. And then when we think about the world in the right way and we combine that with the ethics, the kindness in our life, the sila in our life, these two things together are extraordinarily powerful, sila and right view. And when you put sila and right view together, what happens is meditation. Meditation is the outcome of sila and right view. And that is why the stream enterer can meditate so easily because they have sila and they have right view. Both of these things are perfected in the stream enterer. And because they are perfected, the stream enterer, poof, goes into meditation, yeah, close the eyes and just needs to relax a little bit. Even the stream men need to relax a little bit. They may be tired, yeah, they may be nodding even in the beginning, yeah, but then soon enough, the energy comes back, yeah, and then when the energy comes back, yeah, then meditation happens. And I've always been interested, I, you know, I'm very uh, kind of close to Ajahn Brahm in many ways, uh, because we live in the same monastery, we sit next to each other, uh, and these days, Ajahn Brahm sometimes talks about the default of the mind. The default is like the automatic place where you go. Yeah, it's like a, when you have like a default in a computer, in a computer program, it is the, the automatic settings that kind of come with the computer program. You go back to the default, you go back to the standard settings, if you like. Yeah. And Ajahn Brahm says, meditation is a bit like that. He says, there is a default in the mind, yeah? Someone who is very wise, very skilled meditator, that default is always present. And then when you go back and you sit down, the mind goes to the default. You become peaceful almost straight away because you know where that peace is to be found. You know how to deal with it in the right way. And this is the power of insight, you know, the power of understanding. Yeah. And our job as meditators is to approximate that, uh, move towards that. So we also can have more of that default in our life uh, where the mind automatically goes towards peace, goes toward quiet uh, and enjoys that as a consequence. Uh, this is what we're trying to achieve. And right view is a big part of that. So you want to try to understand a bit more about right view. Yeah. So let's see, uh, let's have a look at these uh, suttas. So um, 